He turned the world of art on its head time and again. I think there's no getting away from Picasso. He managed to transform the whole face of art. His canvas was his diary. When you are brought up with someone who has such a personality, you really think that's really quite normal. His appetite for invention was insatiable. So was his appetite for women. If my husband did to me what my father did to my mother and Dora, I would have killed him. The world has never seen anyone quite like him, and his innovations have yet to be fully understood. The true understanding of Picasso is live with what he did, live with his ugliness, live with his barbaric cruelty upon occasion, and also live with the fabulous generosity of his output, of his work. France. In many ways, Pablo Picasso never left Spain. His art and his soul remain deeply rooted in the 19th century culture of his homeland. I would say that he was the quintessential Spaniard in his point of view, in his passions, in his fear of death. The heart of southern Spain rests in the region of Andalusia, Picasso's fatherland. It is a place whose very identity is steeped in passion and drama, love and death. In spite of its centuries-old culture, Picasso's birthplace, the city of Malaga, like all of Andalusia, was looked down on as provincial by Spaniards from the north. One must never forget that Picasso was an Andalusian born at the end of the 19th century. I mean, the whole concept of machismo is Andalusian, and he saw himself as a macho guy. Picasso's father, Don Jose Ruiz, was genteel, a middle-class Andalusian, but no less macho for it. He, like most of his friends, made good use of Malaga's brothels. Pablo's mother, Dona Maria Picasso, was 23 when Jose proposed to her. But she quickly assumed the role of the strong Spanish matriarch. The two were married in December 1880. Ten months later, on October 25, 1881, Pablo was born. As the oldest child and only son, Pablo was adored, almost worshipped by his mother. She told him he was destined for glory. If you are a soldier, you will be a general, she told him. If you are a priest, you will be a pope. That was accepted. As we say here in Spain, he was the niño bonito, sort of spoiled child or mama's boy. You must never forget with Picasso that he was brought up in a household of women. His father, at the end of the day, would go to the cafe and spend hours with his buddies. Meanwhile, back at home, the mother, two aunts, two sisters, a maid, were all doting on Picasso, and uh, hence a rather complicated relationship with all the women in his life. All that female adoration gave Pablo a powerful belief in his own possibilities. He became the center of the household, displacing even his father. Pablo's father's interests were outside the home. He longed to win fame as an artist, but his talent fell rather short of his dreams. He painted mostly pigeons, he gave art lessons and worked part-time as a curator in Malaga's museum. It was clear early on, however, that things were going to be different for his baby son. Pablo picked up a pencil and tried to imitate his father before he learned to speak. His mother used to say that the first syllable he pronounced after mama and papa was peas which meant pencil because he used to see his father draw and already wanted to do so. This means he already had the instinct. Apart from drawing, the thing that fascinated Pablo most was the bullfights. It is a passion typically Andalusian in its romance of death.
The bloody spectacle made a searing impression on Pablo's young imagination. He was only eight years old when he began creating scenes of death in the bullring. He was brought up with this uh, love of bullfights. His father used to take him to bullfights. And so it's man over beast. And uh, then it's also a dance, a wonderful dance of love between the, the man and the animal, and um, which has to end in death. It's a big love story that ends in death. Throughout his life, people who met Picasso were taken aback by the intensity of his eyes, an enduring legacy of his southern Spanish heritage. There was this strange Andalusian phrase, it's called Mirada Fuerte, but what it's about, the strong gaze, to possess an object with his eyes. One of his early friends said they were amazed that Picasso, when he looked at a piece of paper, there was anything left because the eyes were so strong. They sort of, uh, it seemed as if he was going to burn the image off the paper. Pablo was a child obsessed. All he wanted to do was draw. As soon as he looked at a sheet of paper, he saw things no one else did. To him, even arithmetic lessons opened a door to a world of pictures. There's the famous story that he used to look upon seven as a nose upside down. So how could he begin to deal with numbers if they were so alive for him? Every time he drew a seven, it was a different kind of nose. Different noses. So he'd think of different people and so forth. His mind would go off. Pablo would always be indebted to his father for teaching him to draw as a child. But as his son flourished, Jose was left to face the fact that his own prospects as a painter had fallen flat. And I always feel that a lot of Picasso's ambition and drive to become the greatest painter in the world came from the fact that he had to exorcise his father's appalling failure. I think that this is at the root of Picasso's um, determination to become a better draftsman than anybody, to uh, become the greatest painter in the world. When he was 13, Pablo started painting in oil. He made portraits of his mother, his sisters, and his aunts, and of his beloved but despairing father. The first painting of his father showed him quite depressed. His portraits, they are quite uh, psychological portraits, but very acute. Pablo's first taste of romance came when he was 13. He became smitten with a girl, Angeles Mendes, and his feelings for her ignited his creativity. In his sketchbook, he depicted her as an angel flanked by cupids. Eroticism has always gone hand in hand with the work of Picasso. When he met this girl, his work becomes inspired by his erotic feelings. In 1893 or 1894, I believe his genius was revealed. His crush on Angeles was fierce, but the inspiration it sparked went far beyond an adolescent craving. In his work, such as this painting of a local beggar girl, he began to show the emotional depth that would become a hallmark of his genius. In 1895, Picasso's father got a job in Barcelona, Spain's most cosmopolitan city. The move would pluck the young, naive Pablo from the centuries-old culture of southern Spain and send him hurtling into the modern world. Pablo was 13 in 1895 when his family moved to Barcelona in northern Spain. The city's industrial economy was booming. But the prosperity also brought strikes, riots, and violent protests across the city. For adolescent Pablo, Barcelona was an awakening. His adolescent unrest coincides with the unrest in Barcelona. He arrived in Barcelona at a moment of great upheaval. The sociological and social climate of Barcelona is a springboard for Picasso's nature. Don Jose began teaching at the prestigious School of Fine Arts. He was eager to show off his son's talent. The drawings Pablo submitted in his entrance exam took him straight to the advanced class. 
For anyone who has spent any time around art schools, what is most remarkable about Picasso's early work is the unhesitating facility with which he applied himself to whatever subjects came his way. It's not something that can be taught. Picasso's talent astounded his classmates, who were older and far more sophisticated. After classes, they introduced Pablo to the cafes where writers and artists gathered. Political talk in Barcelona had begun to turn toward anarchy. Anarchists called for the abolition of all government. Drawing on this, progressive artists raised...